I am Lainey Feingold, and I am really excited to be here sharing two of my favorite topics and their intersection, digital accessibility and structured negotiation, which is a collaborative dispute process problem solving method. On the title slide, I have my name, I have my website, which is lflegal.com. I do a lot of writing about both of these topics, so I invite you to visit the site. Everything's organized by subject matter on the topics page. I'm on Twitter at lflegal. I love the Twitter community for accessibility. If you're not part of it, I really invite you to become part of it. And I say LinkedIn up here because luckily I seem to be the only Lainey Feingold on LinkedIn. The only other thing to mention on the title slide is there is a dolphin smiling in the background of the blue slides. And we'll talk a lot more about uh, why I use a dolphin as my icon image spirit animal. Um, but just to say, if you have to leave now, the real message of this talk is that when you're advocating for accessibility, you don't have to be a shark. You can be a dolphin instead. So hopefully you can stay for the talk and discover more what that actually means. So um, what do we want to do today? Here is today's roadmap in a quick 40 minutes, plus time for questions. What is structured negotiation? I wanna share some stories of the 25 plus years. I wanna talk about the elements so you understand it better. Um, I wanted to pull out from those elements, key structured negotiation elements and strategies for digital accessibility, regardless. This is not a talk for lawyers. This is not a talk just for people who might have legal issues. This is a talk for anyone who wants to learn some additional skills for advocating around digital accessibility, regardless of your role. Um, and then we're gonna talk about why it works, the secret sauce. So let's get started. What is structured negotiation? From 1995, when the whole thing started, till today, 2022, and hopefully into the future, to me, structure with negotiation was what I have up on the slide, a collaborative way to resolve legal claims without lawsuits. I have the without in my emphasis color um, to say that is how I have used the process. I have not had to file an accessibility lawsuit, but once in the past 25 plus years, um, the process has worked and we'll share some, you know, when we get to the story part, we'll share some stories um, to advance accessibility without lawsuits. I wrote my book about structured negotiation in 2016. Well, between 2016 and 2022, I talked to a lot of people who were using the process in different ways. And so now I have an added definition from 2016 to 2022, which goes on top of the original definition, which is structured negotiation can also be a way to collaborate after a lawsuit is filed. Just because there's a lawsuit doesn't mean it has to be all fighting and screaming and reputation destruction. So it's a way to collaborate after a lawsuits file. And also it's a process full of strategies to advocate for accessibility unrelated to legal claims. So it's so great talking to the audience. I wish we were, uh, I could see everybody. I can't, but I know that if you're here at XCON, you care about accessibility, you're in a lot of different roles. And in all those roles in some way, you are no doubt advocating, pushing, trying to increase and enhance accessibility. So structured negotiation has proven to be a tool for that regardless of the legal issues. So let's start with some stories on how I've used it as a lawsuit alternative. We have the jumping dolphins in the background. I really want to give a shout out to my web developer, Natalie McLeese of digital. Um, her website is hired digitally, A11Y, who not only built me a beautiful website, but gave me this matching slide template that matches the website and has the dolphins on the back. So I thank Natalie for that. Um, okay, so the roots of structured negotiation are in the financial sector. This is an image of an audio jack um, at an ATM. Um, there's a a jack where you can plug in a headset. There's a sign that says audio jack. There's a raised arrow. Can't really see that it's raised in the image, but it is pointing to the jack with a picture of headsets and braille that says audio jack. In 1994, which is why we have the 25 plus years of collaboration around accessibility, um, 
1994, blind people and the California Council of the Blind came to me. I was working at the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, as well as a private firm with my colleague, Linda Dardarian, and said, you know, there's not a single ATM in the whole country that we can use independently. The ADA was five years old. There was some language in the regulation about independent access, but without ATMs at talk, blind people were denied access to their own money. So we were lawyers and our job was to figure out, uh, you know, what can we do with this claim? And, you know, I heard Tim Berners-Lee this morning, just as an aside, and I always knew that browsers were called user agents, but I, I never quite understood why that term was a term until Tim Berners-Lee said today that, the browsers are designed to assist the users. And he said, kind of like lawyers are supposed to always be in service to their clients. And I love that. And I also love that he said that um, the whole web was designed to be optimized for collaboration, optimized. And that's why accessibility is so essential. And kind of structured negotiation is optimized for collaboration and inclusion of disabled people in the process. So we could have filed a lawsuit. We didn't file a lawsuit. Instead, we wrote to banks, Bank America, Citibank, Wells Fargo. We said, hey, can we sit down with you and talk about the need for talking ATMs? Talk about the need for financial privacy for blind people to their own money. We had an amazing group of blind people. And as I said, the California Council of the Blind, the bank said, yes, I tell more of these stories in my book, but for the purpose here, the important thing to know is the bank said yes, and we didn't have to file a lawsuit. We worked together for three or four years developing this technology that hadn't existed before we started talking to the banks and we were in ATM labs and blind people gave feedback and input. Everything that happened, and we'll see throughout this talk, I hope another takeaway is everything that happened in the structured negotiation, win-wins can happen without any law at all. It can happen when teams bring in people with disabilities to have integral input into processes. When organization hire, when organizations hire disabled people at every stage of the process. So I use these things within a legal context, but they are also applicable outside. In about 1997, one of our clients, one of our blind clients came to us, we were making progress on the ATMs and they said, you know, great job, we're getting ATMs, but there's this new thing, online banking. And if we don't make that accessible, then we're gonna once again be locked out. And this was one of my earliest examples of listening to disabled people, listening to blind people. Our clients in the ATM cases were early adapters of technology. They had all these hookups. They knew the web was coming. I mean, the web had started, but that it was gonna be big. Tiny number of people were using online banking at the time, but we went to Bank America. I have a picture up here of a keyboard with the word accessibility instead of a tab. We went to Bank America and said, hey, it's a new thing. We need to work on accessibility of your website too. And because we had the relationship, that's another thing. Structured negotiation has succeeded because of relationships. Because we had the relationship with Bank America, we weren't in a legal context where there were a million ways for them to say no, no, no. They said yes. They had already met our clients, worked with our clients. So in 2000, the very first web accessibility agreement in the United States was negotiated between this group of blind clients and Bank America. And ever since then, Bank America has been a wonderful partner in accessibility work. So we did that. We're like, whoa, was that just luck? We got the talking ATMs, we got the websites, we got other things, training, testing, um, or was it something that could be replicated? And uh, as Larry Goldberg said in the talk the other day, leap in the net shall appear. We kind of leaped and said, let's call this thing something and see if we can use it in other contexts. So we called it structured negotiation. We'll talk about the structure in a minute. And we used it with banks. Blind people would call us from all over the country. This was before a lot of bank consolidations. We did a lot of work in the financial sector. We did work in the healthcare sector. This is a picture of a billboard that CVS put up in an airport. It says, for those who can't see pill bottles that talk, to help the vision impaired take their prescriptions properly, we offer a device that reads labels aloud. 
This was a while ago. CVS has continued to be a committed and wonderful partner on the talking prescription label issue. Just this past six months, they announced that they have their talking label system built into their app. And again, this was because we worked in structured negotiation. The company got the commitment. They didn't want to say no because they met our clients who were blind people who were telling them, you know, without talking labels, we have to remember what's in the bottle. We put one bottle in the kitchen, one in the bathroom, rubber band on one, two rubber bands on another. And because we were able to form the relationship and uh, the company could really see firsthand the impact of what the lack of accessibility means, we were able to get this great relationship and good um, accessibility with the labels. Walmart also was a great early adopter of talking labels because of structured negotiation we did with them. And they still have a great system in place using the script talk system from Envision. We did structured negotiations with other medical centers, you know, since before COVID on uh, website accessibility, on app accessibility, on the availability of large print. And so this was, this was something. We named it and it worked, so we kept using it. And I have a picture here of Brian Charlson, who's a Red Sox fan, also an accessible technology specialist, retired from the Carroll Center. And he came to me after we had been doing uh, accessible pedestrian signals, safety, privacy of finance, privacy of health information. And he said, hey, do you think this could work with Major League Baseball? Because we don't have good access to the website. We can't listen to our home games. We can't read statistics. And I'm embarrassed to say now that I was like, well, Major League Baseball, like how important is that? And it's just entertainment. You know, we're civil rights lawyers. We're working on the civil rights of disabled people to participate. And Brian and all the other blind baseball fans taught me that participation is about everything and everywhere. And when we talk about the need for accessibility, it's not just financial payment, security, privacy, it's everything. We live in a digital world, accessibility is everywhere. And the Major League Baseball structured negotiate, accessibility should be everywhere because digital is everywhere. Um, and Major League Baseball turned out to be a great success. They were a great company to work with for one main reason, that relationship, as I mentioned, is key. We had an early phone call pre-pandemic. We never actually all met in person because we were all over the country, blind baseball fans, lawyers, Major League Baseball. And um, we had a phone call and the even on the phone, the enthusiasm of the blind fans was so palpable and they got to be blind fans. They didn't have to be in a role of someone suing or someone with a legal claim. They were blind baseball fans who needed access. And that was, of course, there were a lot of, there were a couple of years of negotiation and back and forth and reports and all the stuff that so many of you do in your day-to-day -day work to make, accessible, make accessibility happen. Sure, that all happened, but big picture, the motivation was the relationship, having known the blind baseball fans. Then when the first MLB app came out, we continued working with them, kind of a pivot, just like we pivoted from ATMs to the website, we pivoted or expanded from the MLB website to the app. So um, that was another use of structured negotiation. And just a few quick more things. Uh, this is a picture of the University of Illinois Chicago, where there was a great structured negotiation done by Equip for Equality last year um, on for it blind employees and the public and students on all aspects of technology. I bring that up because, you know, a lot of people associate structured negotiation, oh, that's something Lainey Feingel does. And it's something a lot of people do and a lot of people can do. And the Equip for Quality legal team and staff have done a great job. They've done many structured negotiations. So I wanna put that first under the and more so people, disassociate, I don't know, not disassociate the process for me. I mean, I did write the book about it and I've been at it for 25 plus years, but this is something that we all, I really believe I wouldn't be doing these talks if I didn't think that there were strategies and stories and lessons from these past 25 years that 
all of us can really use in our advocacy efforts. Um, we did work on accessible grocery stores and online shopping, and we did a lot of uh, work in public sector. This is a picture of the Houston bus system. I did a structured negotiation with Disability Rights Texas, who's also done a lot of structured negotiation. Um, so, uh, Yes, I have a lot of content I want to share with you. So I apologize for the talking. I'm thankful for the transcribers and the sign language interpreters keeping up with me here. Um, OK, so that's just a sample of how we view structured negotiation without um, a lawsuit as a way to stay out of the fighting legal system and work on collaboration, which is so key, is so key to accessibility. Um, but let's share a little bit about what's happening of people using structured negotiation inside a lawsuit. There's two things I wanna bring to your attention. One is the recent settlement with ADP and the San Francisco Lighthouse. I have the ADP logo up here. And I also have a picture of a camper as a San Francisco Lighthouse as a camp. And these are three campers. And the reason I put that up is often in law, people think of, oh, the case is just the name. It's a case about CVS or ADP or MLB, but ethical lawsuits and structured negotiation are about people. They start with real claims or real problems or real barriers faced. So in ADP in the San Francisco Lighthouse, they did file a lawsuit, but and my hat is off to both ADP and the Lighthouse and their lawyers. They said, okay, we needed this lawsuit. And I am a big believer in ethical civil rights lawsuits. I try to always say that because in sharing the tools of structured negotiation, I'm not here to say lawsuits are valuable. I'm here to say, here's another set of tools and advocacy strategies that have worked. So in this case, they filed the lawsuit, but then they said, you know, let's see if we can work it out within the lawsuit. And they came up with a great settlement. I have an article on my website if you wanna read more about it, if you wanna read the settlement, if you wanna read what they said about structured negotiation. And the other example inside a lawsuit is an important case going on right now that the National Association of the Deaf has brought against Sirius XM around the need to capture to have transcripts and other accessibility features of podcasts. Again, the lawsuit was filed. And I just want to read you something they filed in court two weeks ago, um, which was this, to avoid potentially unnecessary litigation and the expenses of that. And in order to determine the feasibility of reaching a resolution, the parties have agreed to proceed under the terms of a structured negotiation agreement. That's what they told the court. The structured negotiation agreement is an element where parties sit down at the beginning and figure out what are we going to talk about and what are the issues and, you know, in the legal context, protecting rights for further action. But the bottom line here is structured negotiation offers a set of tools for people even once they're in a lawsuit. So in the NAD versus serious case, they have about 100 days left to see if they can work it out. So stay tuned on that. Um, and then just a couple things about stories not related not related to law. Sorry, I got, I got confused by the timer, but I'm on track. Um, yeah, I want to share two things. And again, when my book first came out and more people started reading it, uh, people came to me and said, you know, these are helpful strategies to me in my advocacy work around accessibility. And one person who told me that is Sassy Outwater Wright. I have a picture of Sassy here. She's a blind woman. She's actually looking quite sassy in her uh, picture taken outside. You can see her tattoos and her red fingernails. And she is the executive director of the Massachusetts Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired and a national advocate on accessibility issues um, and other disability issues. And, and she told me the following, which is, my job as executive director, I have to bring people to the table to work with us and and I have, sorry, I have to bring people to the table to work with us and value the disability experience. Structured negotiation helps me remember that attitude, attitude is a huge part about both leadership and advocacy. We're gonna talk about the structured negotiation attitude in a minute. Um, and then another one I wanna share is Josh Kim, who's a designer, um, like I know many in the audience are, and this is a picture of Josh. He's got a t-shirt on that says, digital equality is my jam. Um, and he says this, not putting folks on the defensive, using persistent and positively framed language, sticking to facts without over-dramatizing, 
modeling trust expected from others. The list goes on and on. The structure and negotiation strategies are all so relevant to the way we should collaborate in the design process with internal team members and leaderships. So um, I thank Josh for that. He, I did a talk at the .gov conference that he helps organize. He's a government designer in DC. And when he introduced me, he said, oh, this book helped how I worked. And I wrote to him afterwards. I said, can you tell me more about that? And it reinforced what Sassy had said and what other people have said about these strategies being useful outside of a legal context. So um, I want to just quickly go over the big picture elements before we dive into some of the key ones. Dive, kind of a pun because the dolphins are diving there. So the elements are uh, illustrated here with a picture of a honeycomb and a bee on it. And the reason for that is when I did the first edition of the book, the publisher sent me the cover, which I had no control over, and it had hexagons all over it. And I was like, oh, my God, this looks like a geometry book. Um, but optimism is a quality of structured negotiation. And I did some research on hexagons. And it turns out that if a collaborative process needs a geometric shape, hexagon is the perfect one because in nature, hexagons are long lasting. Hexagons are flexible. There's so many things in nature that are in the shape of a hexagon, including a honeycomb, which we have here in close up. And when the bees make the honeycomb, I discovered they're basically working as one unit. You know, they're collaborating to build this thing. So I like it as an image. Plus, honeycomb is sweet. Those of you who heard me speak before know that I really like imagery and metaphors that remind people that accessibility is not a checklist. It's not just a legal requirement. It's sweet, it's good, it's good for business, and most of all, it's crucial to inclusion. So the elements just overall is making sure everyone you're advocating with, even if it's just yourself, even if it's just yourself, are on a collaborative page. Because if you're not committed to collaboration, there are so many opportunities to throw in the towel and say, this isn't working, I'm gonna file a lawsuit, or this isn't working, I'm gonna do a negative press release or raise the stakes or get angry. So getting people on the same page, having an opening communication that's inviting, I have an asterisk here, because we're gonna dive into that. Having ground rules, like I said, that they're using within the filed case that we use in all our cases. Um, doing information sharing that's really based on what information do people need. I'm gonna dive into that as an asterisk having expertise that helps everyone. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Also drafting an agreement and structured negotiation in the legal context, the goal is always a written agreement. Um, transparency is a key value of mine personally, as well as the process. On my website in the settlement tab, you can read um, almost all the agreements I've negotiated over time. I have another tab for where you can agree, where you can read other structured negotiation settlements that other people have negotiated. So drafting the agreement, talking about money, which is an element of many legal claims and also something that has been achieved in structured negotiation, talking about media strategies. Um, when I was interviewing lawyers that I had worked with for the first edition of my book, I talked to the general counsel of a big company, a national company, and he said, you know, I think what you have going for you maybe even more than not filing a lawsuit is that you're not starting out with a negative press release or negative, you know, Twitter or attacks on social media. And instead we're waiting for the structure negotiation magic to do its work. It's not really magic, but the, the hard work of collaboration and relationship building. So we have something positive to say at the end. On the topics page of my website, you can read structured negotiation press releases from many large companies that follow that strategy. Um, we monitor and implement agreement because you know what, just like in the work you do, no matter how committed an organization is, even if there's a legal document requiring certain things, things happen. Things happen. I think that's one thing that COVID has taught us. You know, things happen. So we've done negotiations with very large stores, national chains, Walmart, Target, CVS, thousands of stores. Things go wrong. You know, we're working on in-store technology. Things go wrong. So because we have the relationship, we're able to monitor and implement, make sure things stick. 
regardless of what happens after the paper sign. And that's kind of like the same work you all have to do if you're not in the legal space, when you have a roadmap and maybe it's slightly derailed and you have to get back on, you have to be persistent. So mindset and language, those are the final two elements we'll do a deep dive into. Let's talk about the deep dive. So um, centering disabled people is an element and it's also something that infuses the entire process and has really contributed to its success. And um, for that, I wanna introduce you to Lori Gray. I have her image here. She's a blind woman. Um, she's wearing her signature cowboy hat. She's also uses a wheelchair and she's at the Ed Roberts Disability Campus here. And she was a claimant in a negotiation we did with the credit report companies. And I interviewed the lawyer, one of the lawyers, there was a huge set of lawyers, um, one of the lawyers for the company afterwards, four or five years afterwards, and she said this, disability awareness is now in the DNA of our company, in part because we remember dealing with your individual clients. I remember Lori Gray, who couldn't use Braille and needed audio format. I will never forget her. And I often told the story of that meeting to others in the company. They will never forget her either. Structured negotiation gave us the opportunity to have those kinds of meetings inside a legal claim. But those of you who are advocating for accessibility, you don't have to wait till there's a, a legal claim. You don't have to start a legal claim to have these kinds of meetings and bringing people with disabilities into the organization as employees. And if you don't, if you're not ramped up yet with employees, or even if you are working with nonprofits and other consultancies that can bring disabled employees, disabled people to the table is really key. Um, so another one I wanna share with you is this. I wasn't quite sure how to put this on the slide. Basically it says the most holy shit moment of my career, even though I typed the swear word S star star T. That is something that someone in a legal department told me six years after a meeting with our clients. And the moment that for her was such a highlight, such a never forget moment of her career was seeing someone use a braille display on their site. People aren't familiar with braille displays, even today, even though this meeting was several, you know, I think she told me six years ago and she told me this year. So that is a reminder that we can all have these kinds of meetings and these kinds of meetings, I'm not saying every structured negotiation case, you know, I only have 40 minutes. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with when things didn't work out as well. I wanna share with you when they did work out well and when they work out the best, it's when we're able to have this, this kind of meeting. I am open and transparent when they don't. So if we have time in the questions, we can go to that or you can email me offline. Um, the invitation to negotiate or to engage, if you're not negotiating, you're just trying to get engagement, is really key to structured negotiation because too often the start of a conversation is like this image, pow, punch in the face, cartoon punch in the face, which I don't really like to use violent images, but this is really what I'm trying to convey here, that a negative press release, a, a snarky social media uh, message, uh, a legal complaint for sure, is like a punch in the face. And we, in structured negotiation, the first engagement is to try to engage and say, this is something we want to work on, not you must do this by a certain time. So there's an X over the punched guy and there's a very fancy invitation because basically that's what we're doing. How do you do that? Explaining the problem by telling a story by focusing on people with disabilities, by leading with the barrier, by leading with the fact that blind people have to put a rubber band on their prescription if the labels aren't talking, by leading with the fact that blind people risk their lives crossing streets that don't have accessible pedestrian signals. Um, talking about the law without emotion, you know, people get very emotional about the law. And again, I should say all these things are strategies to achieve an end goal. So in some of these things, you kind of have to make it, you kind of have to fake it till you make it. You might have a lot of emotion around the law, like you're violating the ADA. That's very different than saying, you know, we have a civil rights law in this country and the whole core of it is inclusion 
and not leaving disabled people out. So being honest and transparent and being positive, this is something we can do in structured negotiation, um, which is hard to do in a lawsuit, which is when there's something good to say, we say it. For example, I wrote a letter once to a finance company and they were very generous through their foundation arm in giving money to disabled people. I'm like, that's so great that you do that. Congratulations. Here's something else you should be doing to ensure inclusion, diversity, whatever it might be. Um, when we're working with these large companies on technology, oftentimes in their stores, well, we haven't been in stores for a while, but when we were oftentimes in their stores, they have very good customer service. People really care. The, the checkout people at the counters, they want to help people, but the technology doesn't work. So we can say, hey, you do a great job with this. You also need to do a great job with that. And the main kind of takeaway on that is this picture, which is a picture of a cat looking at a lion. And I titled the slide, Find the Lion. And this I think is really important to not just the success over 25 years of structuring negotiation, but uh, a roadmap of how we all, whatever role we're in, however we're trying to advance accessibility, everybody sees themselves in a certain way. The biggest company, the people in the biggest company and the smallest company. And now with an increased emphasis on diversity and inclusion and accessibility after the during you know, the pandemic, um, you can go to most websites and find we're, com we're committed to our people, people first, customer delight, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, all these things. We need to let people understand that what they're already committed to requires them to do digital accessibility. Just one little, I have like so many examples of this, but like one, we work with American Cancer Society. They had a ton of information in a ton of different languages. They had nothing for blind people, no braille, no audio, no accessible online. So when we wrote the letter, kind of a common mashup of the other elements, we're like, congratulations, you are setting yourselves up to be the one-stop shop for accurate ethical cancer information in so many languages what we're asking for here fits right in to how you see yourself, to how you see yourself, how you see yourself. So finding the lion, really important. Having useful meetings is an important element. Here's a picture of a Zoom meeting because that's how we meet these days, including today. Um, lots of stories of great meetings, including that credit report one where the company met Lori Gray and took it back for years. Um, but the main thing I want to say here is that every meeting you have, whether it's a phone call, whether it's running into someone in the hall, if you're lucky enough to be back at work, if you want to be, um, whether it's a letter, wh whatever it is, there's the topic that you're talking about, you know, let's talk about the roadmap or let's talk about this one barrier or let's, whatever you're talking about, plus the subtext of collaboration. We can never forget that we're trying to work this out. So when, you know, when you're talking to someone, when you're having a meeting, you kind of have to tell yourself in advance, okay, I'm gonna go in there. We're gonna really try to nail down this, that, or the other thing. And we're gonna do it in a way that makes the person we're talking to feel included and in all the other elements of collaboration. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, experts without Battles is really key. This is a picture of Kim Charlson and her guide dog. Kim is a blind woman. She was first woman president of the American Council of the Blind. She's the first woman to run a talking book library, which she does at Perkins. And she has been instrumental to so much of my work over the years, particularly she's an international braille expert. She's part of the World Blind Union. And she's also an expert in the uh, audible prescription label. Issue. So in a traditional lawsuit, one side hires an expert, the other side hires, they're fighting with each other. But in structured negotiation, we try to have agreed on experts because we want expertise. It's not just a label of experts, but sometimes you need expertise. And a lot of times that expertise can come from disabled employees or the disability community. So just one example, we did the accessible pedestrian signal work with San Francisco at the time, there were really two 
primary experts in accessibility about auto, audible prescription labels. And we wanted the city to benefit from that. So we didn't have to hold them for ourselves. We were able to say, hey, let's have joint meetings with our clients and these experts and the city engineers and come up with a solution. Two of our clients in that case, not just were they blind people impacted by the lack of signals, one was getting a master's degree in accessible pedestrian signals. The other was on state and national boards on accessible pedestrian signals. So in a lawsuit, all of that would have been discounted because they were the plaintiffs. But in this process, the expertise of disabled people can be front and center. And you all can do that, whatever your role in advancing for access, advocating for accessibility. So let me just do a time check and make sure I'm on track. Um, I think, it, oof, okay. Uh, I'll just say really quick, big changes require small experiments. This is Harry Potter picture because when we worked on audio description, uh, we we're having trouble with the company, getting them to install the equipment in a theater. We were representing a blind girl and her mother and other blind people. The mom said, could you, get the, could you get the technology in just one theater so we can go to the Harry Potter opening? We did, it was phenomenal. It led to a full national rollout, but so many cases. We wanted thousands of talking ATMs, we celebrated five. Whatever you're doing, whatever your role, you can celebrate successes along the way. Small, one user journey, you know, do them, do them well, celebrate them. Why it works, secret sauce. The foundation of structured negotiation is collaborative language and collaborative mindset. I have a foundation here, a building foundation, a several block building foundation, because like a building, if you don't have the foundation of collaboration, structured negotiation in all of its formats is not gonna work. So just two things on words, the word plaintiff, in a lawsuit comes from a French word meaning wretched complainer. Long story about why that has happened that plaintiffs, even in civil rights cases are seen as wretched complainers. We don't use that term because it's loaded. Defendants, in a lawsuit, the people who get the, let the complaint are called defendants. What does that mean? They're supposed to defend their bad behavior. We don't want anybody defending their bad behavior. We don't use the word defendant. Attitude. This is playing the Jaws theme song as the shark jumps out at the water with all the teeth. With a big red X, because in structured negotiation, you don't have to be a shark and you don't have to act like a shark, which so many of us, myself included, um, when I started all this and for many years felt like this little goldfish with the shark fin strapped upon its back that you don't have to be that way. Um, I hope that by sharing the structured negotiation stories, it can remind us that things can be accomplished, even serious privacy, uh, accessibility, civil rights things can be accomplished without acting like a shark. Instead, the dolphins. These are two smiling dolphins, smiling because they're eating fish, which you can kind of see in the picture, and there's a plastic tube. The plastic tube had the fish in it. If the dolphins did not work together, they would not get the fish. You can look up this experiment. It's a National Geographic story. Dolphins are friendly. Dolphins communicate. Dolphins work together. That's the structured negotiation way. So a couple of dolphin, dolphin qualities to share. One is active patience. I have a picture here of a rose because of this great Rumi quote, who was a 14th century poet who said, patience is not sitting and waiting. It is for seeing. It is looking at the thorn and seeing the rose. It's looking at the night and seeing the day. And patience is hard for us. We want accessibility. We want it yesterday. It should have been yesterday, but change takes time. And patience has really been key. Um, another image, for patients, I use Derek Rabello, the blind surfer who actually came, uh, DQ brought him to a conference a couple of years ago um, because he's a big wave blind surfer from Brazil. He has to wait patiently in the ocean. We can be patient if things take extra time. Um, don't make assumptions and be kind. Your assumptions are the windows on the world. 
clean them off every now and then to see things more clearly. Um, and that's why I have a picture of someone uh, washing the window. So many assumptions are made about disabled people, about the need for accessibility. Our job as advocates is to have the kind of relationship that breaks them down. Finding the yes, I've stood on a mountain of no's for a single yes, is really important. People are going to keep saying no to you. They have to me, almost every case starts with, we don't have to do it. We can't do it. We won't do it. No, no, no. But we're happy to have a meeting with you. All you need, that little opening to start that relationship for advocacy that's collaborative. Fear is a liar. This is an image of a billboard. Fear is a liar. Be curious about fear and dismantle fear. So many things people are afraid of in this space. It's going to cost too much. That's the first thing. No one else is going to use it. It's not good for business. You know, traffic engineers literally thought that if they did audible signals, blind people might get killed because they might misunderstand it. This is a process where you talk about that fear. You listen enough. And I have listening next, a black child and her mother talking, or I'm an older woman talking in sign language and listening. Um, you listen enough to really understand what's holding back from what we're trying to get at. Empathy and flexibility. This is a, a empathy. First of all, let me just say empathy is not sympathy. Empathy is not trying on disability. Empathy is understanding the barriers that we create in our work when we don't design and develop for accessibility. This is Simon, the accessibility helmet. I invite you to research it online. It's very fascinating. And this is a picture of Alice Shepard doing a shoulder stand in her wheelchair because advocacy structure negotiation requires us to be flexible, to pivot when things change, to not freak out when they do. Optimism is a faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. That's from Helen Keller. Another important dolphin quality, because like I said, we will run into roadblocks. roadblocks. I always do. And if we're not optimistic that really trying to form the relationship and selling accessibility in a way that lets people feel good about it, then if we don't keep that optimism and confidence, it's not gonna work. Trust and relationship is everything. Being trustworthy, trusting that if you're trustworthy, the other side is the person you're talking to is going to be trustworthy. Keeping your antenna up, not everybody's trustworthy. And sometimes things fall apart. But in my experience, if I'm trustworthy and I don't make assumptions, it's very hard for the other people to be very difficult. That's my experience. So I'm a little over, but I'm still time for questions. I have a picture here about my of my book. It's called Structured Negotiation, A Winning Alternative to Lawsuits. You can learn more. One of the things I'm most proud of that you can see in this picture is the cover quote that Jenny Leigh Fleury, who um, I'm excited to hear next at AxCon, wrote, on the, wrote for me. And it says, building a more inclusive and accessible world takes patience, partnership, and persistence. And a copy of this book. But... Um, patience, partnership, and persistence. And I have a forward by Haben Germa, which is an honor for me to have on the cover as well. So I'm going to turn it back for questions. I have stay in touch on my final slide with the image of the goldfish with the shark fin. If we don't get to your question, please either leave it on Twitter at LF Legal, or you can reach me by email, lf at lflegal.com, or reach me through my website, lflegal.com. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lainey. Um, yeah, we are a little bit over. Uh, if you join late, I'm Travis from DQ. Um, let's just jump right into questions so we can make the most of the five minutes we have left. And I'm gonna go through these in um, a democratic way because some of them have been upvoted. Um, so first one is from Mark. Um, he says, can you speak to the language of lock-in where a company or organization is tightly tied to an inaccessible platform and needs to make difficult and lengthy changes? Well, um, you know, I can't say anything about the specifics of that without knowing, but this is where the roadmap idea comes. And this is where all the sales pitches that we have comes that um, I think there's more and more today that 
helps us argue that accessibility, first of all, it's a legal mandate. This was not a legal update talk, so we didn't talk about all the requirements of the law, both in the US and internationally. But whatever the issue is, that the first one of the dolphin qualities that come to mind in that question is um, finding the yes. You know, what can we do now? What can, who can we bring in? You know, sometimes in our cases, we have to bring in people who we might write to a bank, but we have to bring in the ATM manufacturer. We write to one person, we have to bring in someone else. So making sure that's part of the meeting thing, making sure the right people are at the table, the commitment is there and the understanding of the why, the why of accessibility. That would be off the top what I'd say on that. Okay, great. Um... And then uh, obviously contact Lainey if we want to get into deeper answers here, um, as she said. Um, Stephanie says, um, thanks Lainey, loving your book. <laughs> um, can you speak at all to structured negotiation in the higher education space? And um, by the way, higher education is a popular topic in the Q&A right now. Yeah, I'm, you know, when I do the legal update, I try to do more on higher education. The, the one thing I did mention, the University of Illinois Chicago settlement, a really good place to see, um, and structured negotiation is really well suited for education because that's really a see the lie, you know, find the lion kind of thing. Like the schools, any education institute should see themselves as wanting to serve students. And our job, whatever it is, in whatever role, is to say, you know, some of these students have disabilities and need accessibility. So the most recent example of a successful structured negotiation is that equipped for equality case with University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Chicago, and the collaboration was spearheaded by an employee, and, but the conversation went broader than that. And that's another part of the flexibility of structured negotiation. Unlike a lawsuit that's very focused on who's bringing the suit, what their rights are, when you can open a conversation on behalf of an employee in a location, then in the higher ed setting, you can also talk about students and you can work with student groups and talk about the public. So. Um, Laura Carlson from University of Minnesota has a great website with where she lists all the accessibility cases, lawsuits, or structured negotiations. So I'd invite you to take a look at that too. Awesome. Um, all right. We'll probably won't get through all these, but let's, uh, Mike says, what can you tell us about um, requirements for government agencies to meet WCAG 2.0 AA requirements? I've heard conflicting results about internal and external requirements, or I think he might have get cut off. It just says rec. You know, I'm going to pass on that one because it's not a legal update. We didn't really talk about the legal issues. Um, there's, you know, when you say government, federal government has one set of rules and there's lots of rules called state governments. Um, if you look on the speaking page of my website, I often do legal updates. I'm going to do one uh, later this week at CSUN. So yeah, let's pass okay. on that. For, for, yep, no problem. Good I was question. Just good question. Being democratic. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, good question. By the, um, so uh, how about Donald, who I happen to know? Um, hi there. Uh, th this is an overseas one. In Europe, we tend not to have legislation that supports litigation. Do you think structured negotiation um, will help where there's no threat of litigation, I think is what he meant. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, I have done a couple talks in Basque Country. There's actually a uh, another... I have two uh, forwards in the book, one from Haben and, and one from the uh, lawyer in Basque Country, Spain, who they've had me over there once live, once virtual to talk about structured negotiation. They actually got structured negotiation written in as a uh, uh, possibility, not like a requirement, but a possibility for working on accessibility issues in Basque Country. So I think you do need some legal foundation but it doesn't have to be threat of lawsuit because take the CRPD, which implies, you know, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities has a lot of great language on accessibility. So structured negotiation can be a way of introducing uh, the CRPD requirements, even if there's not a litigation avenue. But I'd love to talk more about that. Um, sure, and, and with that, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much, Lainey, and thank you everyone for your participation. Um, please um, see the slide or check the, um, the event page on the website if you would like to further contact Lainey or watch the session again. Um, again, thank you all so much. Thank you.